China is engaged in an ambitious, some would say aggressive, bid for sea power. It's building out a new navy, one that in the end will be bigger than that of the United States. But is this something that should be feared? Joining me and George Friedman to discuss this is the writer Robert Kaplan. Thanks for being with me. Can we start with China's Navy goals? Is it just a question of protecting their marine sea routes or is it uh, much more assertive than that? Um, it's assertive in a kind of backhanded way. Um, the Chinese are, seem to be developing a propensity to have area, what's called area denial strategies, anti-access area denial. And what that means is making it harder for the U.S. Uh, United States carriers, destroyers, submarines to get close to the Chinese mainland, to get into the South China Sea. Um, not to fight a war with China, but simply to affect the decision-making that goes into America's deployment decisions. And one of the ultimate aims of power is to affect the decisions of your adversary. Um, this is, you know, this gets to the, root, or to the root of the problem. See, since World War II, the United States has operated in the Western Pacific as if it was a private American lake. And that isn't what the Americans want, is it? Well, it's not clear what the Americans want. The Americans have an inherent interest in maintaining global sea lane control. The United States won that after World War II. It is the foundation of American national security. What policymakers want or think they want or don't want really isn't very interesting. It's This is what we have. In the process of this, the Chinese have a fundamental fear. If you take a look at the South China Sea, there's a fear that the U.S. Navy will come in there and blockade Chinese ports. If they were to do that, this would be an economic catastrophe for China. China must, as any nation must, assume the worst case scenario, and it has to have a capability of denying that. So they have a sea lane denial capability. Uh, whether it can deny a U.S. carrier battle group or three of them the ability to not operate, there is another question. Their submarines are there, their missiles are there. But that's a totally reasonable policy for a country, a rising country, like China to take, isn't it? Well, what makes a policy reasonable is if it achieves your goals and you have the means of executing it. So you don't have a very reasonable necessary goal if you can't do it. Well, wars don't only occur because of some nefarious power. They happen when legitimate rising powers and legitimate established powers come into conflict in terms of their interests. Um, you don't need a nefarious um, uh, a goal or, or, or some dark motive for there to be war. Wars happen when there's a genuine conflict of legitimate interests. Or a, a genuine concern of the intentions of a country in the future. I mean, we spend a lot of time thinking about what is the intention of Washington. Well, that's not very interesting because, I mean, Washington is divided in many parts. And there's going to be a new president and a new secretary of defense, and they may think about the world very differently. So you plan for the worst case. The issue, I think, uh, that I see as somewhat differently than Bob is the entire question of the ability to build naval power projection. What do you call a blue sky navy? Well, blue a, water a navy. A blue, blue water navy. And what you really mean is the ability to operate a large naval force at distance. And China certainly would like to have that. Uh, many countries would like to have many things. The issue is not whether China has a policy toward achieving that or whether it would like to have that, but whether it is reasonable to expect that sort of power to emerge in the future. At this point, I'm not convinced that the Chinese have sea lane denial. I'm not convinced that even with their missiles, they can deny the U.S. carrier battle groups access because those missiles are highly vulnerable. They're land-based. They can be seen. The United States can strike them as easily as they can strike us. So I see China as in a very early stage of developing naval capacity in general. It is a land power. It is surrounded by internal challenges that the Army has to be used for, potential land challenges. Whether it has not just the resources financially, but whether it has the resources intellectually to create, to man, to command, um, a blue water navy, I think right now the answer is no. Uh, I think it's reasonable for the United States to be concerned about it. It is not yet reasonable to be 
unduly concerned about it. All right, all right. Let me uh, let me counter with several things. First of all, when we, when you said you made that mistake, you said blue sky. That was actually not a mistake, because when we're talking about naval power, we're also talking about air power. Um, because navies and air forces cannot be disaggregated in this day and age. They work together. Um, that's why there's this whole new concept in Washington called air-sea battle. And we should not forget cyber warfare capabilities, because it may be those capabilities which will make the United States able to decapitate Chinese land-based missiles, uh, or it may not be. Um, so cyber is a big part of what we're talking about, even though George is pointing to a maritime space, the South China Sea. Um, George said that China also has land, uh, you know, land threats to worry about. I disagree. I think for the first time, with the exception of maybe the High Qing Empire in the middle of the 18th century, and other periods you can go back, the high point of the Tang Empire, China's land borders are more secure than they've ever been in history. Um, if you look at a map of China, here's China, and you were to superimpose it on the Qing Dynasty, which is the Manchu Dynasty, at the height of its power, the, the maps would look, uh, would look almost alike. Um, China has been busy in the last 15 years uh, solving all border disputes all around its border, all these little disputes. It's China who has the demographic power um, into the Russian Far East. The Russian Far East is being, right here is being slowly depopulated from a population of about 8 million to about uh, six, 6 million. China's got uh, over 100 million people in this area alone. Uh, China is, take, is beating the pants off of the Russians in former Soviet Central Asia, in Kazakhstan, Turkmenistan, Uzbekistan, building pipelines, flooding Central Asian markets with cash. Well, uh, wait, let me. Uh, yes, Pakistan is unstable and it borders China, but I've been at this land border. It's 17,000 feet. You need to take altitude pills not to get sick. What happens on the other side of this border doesn't matter. It's China's going to sea because it has a luxury to go to sea. Because for the first time in living memory, its land borders are relatively secure. China has a huge pipeline system in Kazakhstan hostage to the Russians who control the ministries in Kazakhstan, who have the heaviest influence on the government. Uh, its position there is not something they can deal with militarily, but nor is it secure. But that's not the point. That's not the threat. The People's Liberation Army is not able to project power because it doesn't have a logistical base to do so. It is an internal security force in a country that is unstable first because this border region from Xinjiang down to Tibet is not Chinese, is not Han Chinese, it's occupied territory by China, and it's restive, not to the point of being able to break free, but it's restive. But, but less restive now than it's been for years. But the, danger the Chinese now, have been slowly taking slowly flooding the area with Han Chinese, this taking is, over the but cities. This is the danger here. Han China. Okay. Han China, because China is in the process of dramatically changing its economic process. As Japan went from a high growth economy to a financial catastrophe in an extraordinarily short period of time, for very similar reasons, China is moving to that point as well. How do you know that, George? Well, you know that for a number of reasons. Okay. First, the Chinese, we know what their export numbers are and how dependent they are on their exports. They're hostage to two economies, the American and the European economy. If they don't buy, they can't sell. Their industrial plant is far larger than you can consume in China. Uh, 600 million Chinese live in households earning less than $3 a day. 440 million live in households earning between $3 and $6 a day. Uh, about, 20, about 60 million live in households earning $20,000 a year. That's the China we think about when we think of China. A great deal of China lives in sub-Saharan African poverty. They cannot buy the things the Chinese industrial plant has produced. So the Chinese are now competing by cutting margins. According to the Chinese government, uh, the profit margin on exports is now 1.7 percent, and that's a very optimistic number. They are barely exporting this. Uh, their inflation rate is extremely high because they're lending uh, to 
uh, companies that are unable to pay their loans, so they're lending back. So you now have the classic situation of rising um, wages. Wages now are higher in China than they are in uh, Mexico. And as we've seen in recent newspaper articles, we've known for a long time, there's a massive capital outflow from China, very similar to Japan. We saw in Japan in 1990 massive money moving out, buying particularly things like mineral rights and so on and so forth. And everybody said, my goodness, what a wonderful thing Japan is. I mean, look at all this money. Nobody has to question why would they invest elsewhere if Japan is such a wonderful place. It is the capital flight that is the final indicator of the problem. Those who are the insiders of any company, if they're deciding to move their money out of the company, are giving an indicator. Uh, recent discussions about Chinese elites moving their money out of the country uh, kind of reveals their perception of what the situation is. So the question is, how do we know this? We know this in two ways. Asian debt-driven economies have twice reached catastrophic levels. One was Japan in 1990. The other was in 1997, East Asia. China, after an extraordinarily successful run, is now reaching the limits of what it can do. And one of the reasons we see constant repression in China is the Chinese government clearly understands the danger, is increasing uh, the repression that's going on. The direction of, China, of the Chinese economy is something that the greatest experts in the world disagree on. Um, uh, you know, there is no consensus on this. Meanwhile, you deal with capabilities, not with where some place might be in five or ten years, because you don't know. And, and the reality is their land borders are more secure than ever, and they're building a great I am dealing with capabilities. That's the reality. I know their industrial plant. That's well known. I know the ability of the Chinese population to absorb what they produce. That's well known. They have an export-oriented economy that is utterly dependent on Europe, for example. But which they're trying to change. Trying to change and changing it are two different things. Of course they're trying to change it. They realize that they've made a strategic mistake, or more precisely, they've wound up in a strategic box that follows from it. But with Europe in crisis, the American economy is slow and sluggish. Uh, their primary customers uh, can't buy. So yeah, there is a disagreement. I mean, there's always a disagreement. I recalled, in, I think it was in 19... 93, Business Week, long after the Japanese banks had crumbled, had this wonderful story on the Japanese miracle. Yeah, it takes a while for it to catch up, but the things that we're talking about are already happening, and there's two schools of thought. I mean, there's that school of thought that says, well, this doesn't mean anything. It'll all go back to the way it was. And the other school of thought, mine, happens to be the right one, uh, <laughs> Are you, are you, uh, it's saying, no, this can't go back. It has to go through a new stage. Are you um, saying, George, that um, despite what might be setbacks, um, and they could be more serious or they could be less serious, but the setbacks are going to be sufficiently serious to stop uh, China building out this um, blue water navy? Not necessarily. I mean, look. And, and, and also, another thing we have to talk about is the Chinese are, building, are busy building roads and pipelines across Southeast Asia, uh, particularly in Burma. Um, the, Thailand is weaker politically now than it's been in, in a generation or two. Uh, so it's easier for the Chinese to make inroads. They've essentially taken over Laos. And, I, I, and, I, I'm not denying that the yeah, Chinese have a massive um, effort underway here. Yeah. And, and the critical country towards the Finlandization of this area by China is Vietnam. Which way Vietnam and will I, go? And I absolutely agree with you that the Chinese have a major effort underway here. Yeah. And that takes enormous amounts of resources. Yeah. And that limits their ability to supply the capital needed to even begin the kind of shipbuilding program they have. But, but their shipbuilding program has grown in leaps and bounds. From, in in term, from, from a where very it was, low point, I mean, yes. From a, very, from, from a very low point, albeit, but it is still growing in leaps and bounds. Um, just, you know, between 2000, from the year 2000 on, they built or acquired four times as many submarines as we have. Since 2005, it's eight times this number. Um, they're starting off from a low position, and but we're going in exactly opposite directions. The size of our Navy is plateauing. Theirs is growing dramatically. They already have 60 submarines at sea. They'll probably have about 75 in about 15 years. We'll be below 
below 75. Theirs are diesel electric, ours are nuclear for the uh, uh, nuclear. But again, they don't have to travel a half a world away to get to the conflict zone like ours do. My point is that there's a power shift going on. It may be very relative. It may be very slow and gradual, but we, but af, but after 30 years of uni, of a unipolar American military environment in the Western Pacific, we've got a power shift. And I would argue that there is an attempt at a power shift. There has been no power shift, nor is there likely to be one. This reminds me of the Russian attempt at solving the problem of the North Atlantic during the Cold War. Uh, at that time, their solution was submarines. It faced two problems. The first is that you could potentially stop the American convoys to Europe in the event of war. Uh, but you can't take control of the Atlantic. But more importantly than that, uh, it ignored U.S. anti-submarine warfare capability. The number of ships the United States has is relevant only by two measures. How many significant sh ships the enemy can put to sea and the capability of those vessels. The gulf between an American carrier battle group with all its accoutrements and what the Chinese have built is not closing any sort of gap or threatening to do so for two reasons. Firstly, our ships are so superior and secondly, because our command and control and experience is so superior. So I would argue that, yes, you're right, Bob, they have done wonders in building their navy. The wonder is that in all this effort that they have put into it, the strategic balance has not significantly shifted. I think it has strategic, uh, significant because of the word, it has significantly shifted because of the word you use, strategic. What does strategic mean? It doesn't just mean the navy. It means your demographic heft your geographical centrality, and your economic throw weight. Um, in terms of economic throw weight, um, China is the biggest trading partner for all of these countries, including Australia. They all have to trade with China. Um, they are too close. Uh, Vietnam may ha Vietnamese may hate the Chinese, but they have to get along with it because they're too close. They're right next door, and China is their biggest trading partner. You the combination. Of it being of China being the biggest trading partner of all these countries, um, with the fact that China is finally building its navy, with the fact that China is conducting very aggressive intelligence operations, um, you know it, it, they you know their cyber capacity has broken into the in, into the Japanese government, into other governments who've been attacked by Chinese you know by Chinese uh, cyber warfare. The Chinese are obsessed with you know with dominance in their near abroad. So that they are making a run at a power shift. And a lot will depend, as you said, on the ultimate direction of the Chinese economy and on the ultimate direction of our economy and our politics. But our problem is that the direction of our economy, if it's negative, yeah. will have a massive impact on China. The problem that China has strategically is that it's hostage to its consumer countries. Its ability to buy from other countries, from Australia, for example, depends on the propensity of other countries to buy from it. It's an exporting nation. Yes, it has a domestic economy, but relative to the size of its industrial yeah. plant, it's very small. So, as you point out, who gets hurt more uh, in an American economic downturn? The Chinese problem is they have so little room for maneuver economically. They have a very large population several hundred million making relatively little money in the Chinese industrial plant. If they're laid off, if they become unemployed, this becomes a very dangerous situation. Can I, can I jump in here? Because aren't these two countries, these two powers, really rather dependent on each other? Because, as you said, um, the Chinese need the American imports, but uh, America needs China too. So, why don't they just get along? Or is that well, that's too what fanciful? they're trying to do. This is what makes this the most interesting power rivalry that we've had in, in decades, in centuries. It's not like the U.S.-Soviet rivalry, because the U.S. and the Soviets had relatively nothing to do with each other economically. These are two powers 
that need to get along with each other, that need to support each other's economies, and yet have, di have, have different interests geographically in the Western Pacific. One of the interesting things in the past two years has been the decoupling of American consumption from China. The resourcing to places like Mexico, the Philippines, Sri Lanka, and so on. As China, the cost of Chinese products have risen, and they've risen substantially, uh, the structural shifts that are slowly taking place in the American economy uh, have mattered. The point is the United States has options in where it buys. China has less options in where it sells. So where this doesn't mean that China is going to collapse, disappear, black hole. I mean, these are childish things. But what it does mean is that the tension between the two countries will actually grow, particularly because China is so uneasy about the United States. Um, building on what George said, let me, let me point to the map here. You have what's here the Chinese call the first island chain in the Pacific. Japan, South Korea, the half island of South Korea, Taiwan, the Philippines, the Indonesian archipelago, um, Australia. These are all U.S. allies. So when Chinese Navy planners look outward, they see a great wall in reverse, kind of a chain of uh, allies. And a lot has been made of the Taiwan uh, uh, problem. And the Taiwan problem is often um, discussed in the media through moral terms. You know, we defend China, uh, uh, Taiwan as a democracy. China wants to regain Taiwan to restore its national patrimony. But there's a an amoral strategic angle to this, which is that, as Douglas MacArthur said, or I, I think it was MacArthur, called Taiwan the unsinkable aircraft carrier out at the northern end of the South China Sea. Um, right here. Um, if China were able to envelop Taiwan to make an end run around Taiwanese sovereignty by trading with Taiwan to the degree that it is, I mean, there are 270 commercial flights a week between the mainland and Taiwan. Taiwanese are quite happy yeah. with things as they yeah. are. And, and intimidating Taiwan at the same time militarily, uh, China, you know, China will find, China will thus be able to break out of this island chain and, and you know, and, and direct its strategic energies elsewhere? That's an interesting question, because the only way that China can break out of this is through political military means, economic means. The question is, if you're Taiwanese, I mean, you love your trade relationship with China. It's greatly beneficial to you. At the same time, you don't trust the communist regime, and you don't trust what would happen if your autonomy were subsumed to it. You can't assume that your well-being would be protected. China's ultimate strategy is not a naval one. It goes back to what the Soviets did. It is arming, supporting groups in places like Aceh, in various places in Indonesia, to create instability in those countries, to create openings in the waterways, uh, for example, with the use of new of profusion of anti-ship technologies. Imagine that a guerrilla group could close this off. So I would agree that I'm not worried about the Chinese Navy. I am worried about the Chinese sense of embattlement, and that out of that sense of embattlement, maybe Taiwan, but maybe right that Taiwan does it, I doubt, but it is this whole area that it could potentially destabilize. Um, right. let, me, let me add something. Um, what drives China's insecurity, its sense of embattlement? We should mention it. It's China was a great civilization, world civilization, for thousands of years. But in the second half of the 19th and early part of the 20th century, China was literally raped. Um, the Russia, Japan, and the Western and European powers all took pieces of China. Um, uh, during the, you know, we know about the Ottoman Empire here as the sick man of Europe, but the Qing Empire was the sick man of Asia. And as it collapsed, you had, uh, you had all sorts of runs against t Chinese sovereignty, and it's a humiliation that the Chinese have not forgotten. I'm reading a book now on the Taiping Rebellion. And, you know, and that, that was a virtual civil war inside China while Western forces were taking advantage of it. The Japanese were taking pieces of the coast. So China comes at this with this aggrieved sense of embattlement that's historically and, and, and indeed based. a fear of repetition. Yes. Even now in China, much of the Chinese economic problems in some journals here and there are being blamed 
on Western investment, that Western investors took too much out of China and so on and so forth. So as the narrative in China grows of what's gone wrong, why isn't it right anymore, we're seeing both the memory of this and the use of this in propaganda. That makes it dangerous. This allows me to move on to another aspect of this maritime issue, and that is China's expansion into the Indian Ocean, which is uh, uh, another key ocean. In fact, um, you could argue it's more key than any ocean because of the countries that are around its rim. Uh, the Middle East with all its problems, Africa developing, uh, South Asia with problems. Uh, China is investing its navy power in this area. Can you can you well not exactly its naval power. The you know in Washington, people said to me, "Well, you've written about the Indian Ocean. What should be our strategy?" I said the Indi you don't have a strategy to the Indian Ocean. The Indian Ocean is a concept. It's a concept that allows you to put instability in the Greater Middle East together with challenges in East Asia because the energy is here in Saudi Arabia and Iran, and it's got to get to the customers all through East Asia. So the Indian Ocean is like an interstate. Think of it as an interstate where uh, tankers go from the Persian Gulf through the Strait of Malacca and up to these burgeoning middle-class flesh pots uh, um, in East Asia. Now what China's doing is it's helping to finance modern port modernization projects in Lamu in Kenya in here, in Gwadar in Pakistan here, in Hambantota and Sri Lanka here, in Chittagong in Bangladesh, in Kayuk Fru in Burma. And why is it doing this? Um, because China, uh, um, because China eventually wants, um, you know, a kind of the the 21st century civilian maritime equivalent of 19th century British coaling stations. Um, because be, you know, you know, to to help develop a maritime empire all the way through to Europe, because it's also building ports in Greece and Croatia as well, in the Eastern Mediterranean. Um, so um, China, does China want naval bases in these ports? I don't believe that, because that would be too provocative to India. Um, and China would not be able to defend a base like Gwadar, for instance. A place like Gwadar looks fascinating on the map until you get there, as I've been there, where you're surrounded by Baluch separatists who will kill any Chinese who try to develop it beyond a civilian port. Um, Burma's a different case, though. In, in Burma, the Chinese are building a road and pipeline network across northern Burma from the Bay of Bengal directly into southern China as a way to avoid having to depend on the Strait of Malacca so much. Uh, here, Bob and I agree completely on the criticality of the line of supply from the Persian Gulf through the Straits of Malacca elsewhere and up through the South China Sea and ultimately to Japan as well, which we don't talk about, yeah, we really yeah. should. But to me, when you take a look at the magnitude of the difficulty of protecting it, it shows me the Chinese vulnerability. Whatever ports they build, these seas are controlled if the United States chooses to control them by the Fifth Fleet, by fleets in here. The Chinese do not have the ability of creating a clear waterway free of American intervention into interference potentially potentially and that's their problem there's they are obsessed with the Indian Ocean they should be obsessed with it yeah at the same time it's where they get their energy but from. at the same time creating a solution that I think they're on their, their, their way to a solution George it's not just ports that they're building in all of these places they're also giving significant diplomatic econo and economic support to all of these countries. China is, you know, it, China is the biggest arms supplier for all of these countries that I mentioned. So what is going on? Uh, what is China developing here? You know, we hear the term in Washington, places, not bases. You don't want a full-fledged base because th then, you, th then it becomes a political hot potato in the domestic political environment. What you want is access to places, access built on good, peaceful, diplomatic, economic, bilateral relationships Bob, with those you have countries, access, and that's what China's and building. you have access, you have to have something to send there to access it. 
to use it. But they, they have and a modern merchant navy. They have a modern yeah, merchant I'm navy. Yeah, I'm not talking military but totally. The, I'm talking about I understand. Uh, you know, a peaceful maritime empire and that they, China's and developing. And they will have that and they can use that. But the problem that the Chinese have, and they know it and they talk about it, is that wherever their merchantmen go, their warships aren't there. Not many that's, and that's and unless there's a war, that doesn't matter. But if you're a country, as the United States is, you know, if there's not a war, why do we need a 250 man navy? Let's have a 50, 50 uh, ship navy. navy. Yeah, because nations prepare for the worst, right? For the best, and navies are only noticed when they're not there. And that's when you notice. And the, the Chinese navy. are extremely aware. Yeah, that they um, don't have that navy yeah. there. China, you know, China's conundrum, its problem, is that it's developing authentic anti-access area denial, um, but they're a long ways away from a blue water navy. And so it's a national security which is heavily dependent on the import of raw materials and the export of finished products is dependent in a complex number of ways on the United States. The United States willingness to buy, the price that China can sell, the willingness of the United States to permit the movement of goods. All of these things, when China looks at the world, it sees vulnerability. It sees all the ways oh, that's in which true. it's at risk. Yeah. And that's an asymmetric relationship, I think, between the U.S. and China. Um, right. But here's asymmetry going in the other direction. Like when the Chinese surface a submarine in the middle of an American carrier battle group, as they've yes. done. Um, and what that shows is that's like a prank, in a way. Uh, but the fact that they can do it is a signal to the Vietnamese, to the Malaysians, to others. Uh, it, you know, it, it's a subtle, indirect form of intimidation to these countries that are threatened with Finlandization was, was, by China. It was an interesting move, of course, whether that submarine in wartime conditions would have survived long enough. The yeah. problem the United States had on that story was it had a submarine, Chinese submarine in there. Yeah. It had no permission. <laughs> You know, to the, fire the ash rocks. So it's but surfaced. that's the nation of the world in a media age, where the Chinese can increasingly use asymmetric stunts um, to, you know, to advertise their coming, their their emergence as a, as a power. The United States would never uh, do that stunt because they would want to keep it secret that they could do it. Yeah. The difference is absolutely pointed out by the fact that the Chinese are hoping a stunt will shape international perceptions, the United States has the power. It's not to trivialize China. It is, and I think we're agreeing here, I mean, it is to really face the limits of current Chinese power and remember that that makes it insecure and unpredictable. Well, um, can we just sum this up, um, maybe each in 30 seconds? Uh, will, we see, um, will we see China in conflict with the United States, do you think, in our lifetime? Uh, no. I think what we're going to have is a very tense Cold War of sorts uh, with tensions at sea, uh, our, uh, our, you know, our movements at sea and their movements at sea are increasingly uncomfortable close surveillance contact. Remember we had that incident in 2001 before 9-11 uh, uh, with, with, with the U.S. spy plane that was brought down in, in China. We could see more of that as the, as the maritime space becomes more crowded as we, you know, we uphold our, our ability to, you know, to gather intelligence and the Chinese push back. So it'll be a very tense Cold War of sorts, but the two countries are too interconnected economically, I think, for a major conflict. George? China's had an extraordinary growth period for 30 years. Uh, at the very least, it's going to pause. At the very worst, it'll re retract. Uh, the United States has no desire or interest in conflict with China. China doesn't have the ability to engage in a conflict with the United States. The real, for me, always major East Asia power is Japan. A magnificently efficient economy, even when it doesn't grow. Not burdened with a billion <laughs> impoverished people. But highly socially disciplined. And the worst that can be said about it over the past years is it didn't grow much. And its political class is somewhat emasculated. Its political class can be replaced. Japan is a place where changes take place fast and suddenly and go on for a long time. That's interesting. Ahead. Yeah, well, let's leave to a discussion on the future of Japan, which itself is a major issue, yeah. to our next discussion. Right.